The reality that we are experiencing is just a frequency range, what we call visible light. There are these resources. Any system that is in conflict with the even distribution of the resources to the people is a disingenuous and illusory system. All these things are just ideas. America, just an idea. England, just an idea. Karate, just an idea. Wednesday, just an what idea. What about uh, re reptilian overlord aliens? Definite real thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know about the old reptilian overlord aliens. On some level, they are just a sort of a frequency, a vibration, like us. And I try not to worry too much about the reptilian overlords because I'm close to watching and I am hoping to get a part-time job in the Illuminati. <laughs> One other thing that you need to know about is that I am an alien abductee. I've had numerous encounters with reptilians, with what are known as the reptilian greys. You always hear about the ubiquitous gray beings. Well, the beings that I had encounters with in full waking consciousness were what are known as reptilian grays, what the late great Dr. Carla Turner referred to as the chicken claws. They don't have a long finger and a long nail. They just have claws. And when you wake up and then you find yourself surrounded by three of these things with claws and they're looking down at you, believe me, that can be a pretty traumatic experience. What is still true is, is that you know, uh, there's still kind of a reptilian side of our brain, right? A, 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 that, that part of our brain that if somebody looks different or sounds different, that there's a part of us that is cautious. And what we have to do is fight against that. And I saw it. <sighs> that was a UFO beaming back at you. Me and Eric Heisen were down in Mexico two weeks ago. We seen 40 of them flying in formation. They, 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 they have got bases all over the world now, you know. They've been coming here ever since 1946, when the scientists first started bouncing radar beams off of the moon. And they have been living and working among us in vast quantities ever since. The government knows all about them. I mean, if they're so smart, why don't they just reveal themselves to us, huh, and get it over with? <laughs> why don't they reveal themselves to us is because if they did, it would cause a general panic. Now, I mean, we still have leaders upon whom we rely for the release of this information. These leaders have decided to repress this information because of the tremendous shock that it would cause to our antiquated system. Lorca in that same poem said that the 
iguana will bite those who do not dream. And as one realizes that one is a dream figure in another person's dream, that is self-awareness. dangerous nightmare situation is a simple one. Don't let it happen. It depends on you. I think hatred is wasted energy. You walk into this room at your own risk. Because it leads to the future. Not a future that will be, but one that might be. This is not a new world. It is simply an extension of what began in the old one. It has patterned itself after every dictator who has ever planted the ripping imprint of a boot on the pages of history since the beginning of time. It has refinements, technological advances, and a more sophisticated approach to the destruction of human freedom. But like every one of the super states that preceded it, it has one iron rule. Logic is an enemy and truth is a menace. Any state, any entity, any ideology that fails to recognize the worth, the dignity, the rights of man, that state is obsolete. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone. The good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful. But we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls. Has barricaded the world with hate. Has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed. We have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical. Our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much, we feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now my voice is reaching millions throughout the world. Millions of despairing men, women and little children. Victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed. The bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die. And the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Culture is not your friend. Culture is for other people's convenience and the convenience of various institutions, churches, companies, 
tax collection schemes, what have you. It is not your friend. It, it insults you. It disempowers you. It uses and abuses you. None of us are well treated by culture. Yet we glorify, you know, the creative potential of the individual, the rights of the individual. We understand the felt presence of experience is what is most important. But the culture is a perversion. It fetishizes objects, creates consumer mania. It preaches endless forms of false happiness, endless forms of false understanding in the form of squirrely religions and silly cults. It, it invites people to diminish themselves and dehumanize themselves by behaving like machines, meme, meme processors of memes passed down from uh, Madison Avenue and Hollywood and what have you. How do we fight that? It's a question worth answering. I think that by creating art, art, man was not put on this planet to toil in the mud. Or the God who put us on this planet to toil in the mud is no God I want to have any part of. It's some kind of Gnostic demon. It's some kind of cannibalistic demiurge that should be thoroughly renounced and uh, rejected. By putting the art to the man, we really, I think, maximize our humanness and become much more necessary. The artist's hand holds a spiritual tool of evolutionary vision, and every creative act empowers every other creative act. You know, the painter channels the creative force into the artifact, and this artifact then becomes a battery ready to zap a viewer into a new way of seeing the world. Planetary consciousness becomes cosmic consciousness through human consciousness. One. When we gaze into the eyes of the beloved, we're staring into a sacred mirror, and we recognize our oneness. Cosmic creativity. Art is an echo of the creative force that birthed the galaxies. Creativity is the way that the cosmos evolves and communicates with itself. The great uplifting of humanity beyond its self-destruction is the redemptive mission of art. Thank you. It was beauty killed the beast. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, The kingdom of God is within man, not one man nor a group of men, but in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines, the power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. It's only after we've lost everything that we're free to do anything. What is your definition of happiness? A clear horizon. Nothing to worry about on your plate. Only things that are creative and not destructive. Every thought we think and every word we speak is creating our future. It's as though our thoughts go out into the universe and are accepted and brought back to us as experience. In our world, there will be no emotions except fear, rage,
triumph and self-abasement. The sex instinct will be eradicated. We shall abolish the orgasm. There will be no loyalty except loyalty to the party. But always there will be the intoxication of power. Always, at every moment, there will be the thrill of victory, the sensation of trampling on the enemy who is helpless. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. The moral to be drawn from this dangerous nightmare situation is a simple one. Don't let it happen. It depends on you. Far out. Those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed. The bitterness of men will fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die. And the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species, lived there on the mote of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world, that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason, a world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams. The cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We're here on chance, and we're going to go away. And the planet will heal. The planet will heal, because that's what it does. It heals itself. It's a self-healing organism. It changes and grows. It'll incorporate all of our dead cities into itself, and it will become something else. But it will still be going around the sun for at least a few more billion years. 
I think we squandered a great gifts. I think humans were given great, great gifts. Walking upright, binocular vision, opposable thumb, large brain, making tools. Talk, have to link language, you take this foot in here. We learned language, the brain got bigger, language. We grew, we had great gifts, and we gave it up all up for both money and God. Both. We gave it up to the high priests. It's your job. It's God's will. That's what they say. People say it's God's will. Way of mowing, <laughs> he's singing which direction we are going. There's no knowing where we're rowing, rowing. or which way the river's flowing. Not a speck of light is showing, so the danger must be growing. Are the fires of hell a glowing? Is the grizzly reaper mowing? Yes! The danger must be growing, for the rowers keep on rowing, and they're certainly not showing any signs that they are slowing! We gave it all up to superstition, primitive superstition, primitive shit. With an invisible man in the sky looking down, keeping track of what we do, make sure we don't do the wrong thing. If we do, he puts us in hell and we burn forever. That kind of shit is very limiting. It's very limiting for this brain we have. The sky's the sky everywhere you go. And people are people. Creation seems to come out of imperfection. It seems to come out of a striving and uh, a frustration. And this is where I think language came from. I mean, it came from our desire to transcend our isolation and have some sort of connection with one another. When it gets really interesting, I think, is when we use that same system of symbols to communicate all the abstract and intangible things that we're experiencing. What is like, frustration? Or what is anger or, or love? When I say love, the sound comes out of my mouth and it hits the other person's ear, travels through this Byzantine conduit in their brain, you know, through their memories of love or lack of love. And they register what I'm saying and they say, yes, they understand. But how do I know they understand? Because words are inert. They're just symbols. They're dead. <laughs> and so much of our experience is intangible. So much of what we perceive cannot be expressed. It's unspeakable. And yet, you know, when we communicate with one another and we, we feel that we have connected and we think that we're understood, I think we have a feeling of almost spiritual communion. And that feeling might be transient, but I think it's what we live for. <laughs> the sky's the sky wherever you go. Hey, D.W. Vampires don't exist, Corneal. Bernie, watch my chops. You can hear me, and dogs don't speak. So? So? So, if vampires... Oh, forget it. <laughs> So, Bob, 
No, I wasn't fucking bored. I'm never bored. That's the trouble with everybody. You're all so bored. You've had nature explained to you and you're bored with it. You've had the living body explained to you and you're bored with it. You've had the universe explained to you and you're bored with it. So now you just want cheap thrills and like plenty of them and it doesn't matter how tawdry or vacuous they are. As long as it's new, as long as it's new, as long as it flashes and fucking bleeps in 40 fucking different colours. Or whatever else you can say about me, I'm not fucking bored. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. 7,000 men armed with rifles and machine guns pitted against a single fighting machine of the invaders from Mars. 120 known survivors. The rest strewn over the battle area from Grover's Mill to Plainsboro, crushed and trampled to death under the metal feet of the monster, or burned to cinders by its heat rays. You know what I think? I think that we're all in our private traps, clamped in them, and none of us can ever get out. We scratch and, and claw, but only at the air, only at each other. And for all of it, we never budge an inch. Sometimes we deliberately step into those traps. Do you remember what you told me once? That every passing minute is another chance to turn it all around. I'll see you in another life when we are both cats. I didn't much think about what it would be like for me because I don't think it's likely there's anything that you think about after you're dead. That's um, it. <laughs> yeah, long, dreamless sleep. I'd love to believe the opposite, but I don't know of any evidence. But one thing... Faith, Carl. Faith. One thing that it has done is to enhance my uh, sense of appreciation for the beauty of life uh, and of the universe and the, the sheer joy of being alive. Oh, that's beautiful. Every moment, yeah, every... Every inanimate object, seems to say nothing of, of the exquisite complexity of, uh, of living beings. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you imagine missing it all and suddenly it's so much more precious. understand that black implies white, self implies other, life implies death, or shall I say, death implies life. Catalysts to say what has never been said, to see what has never been seen, to draw, paint, sing, sculpt, dance and act what has never before been done to push the envelope of creativity and language. And what's really important is, I call it, the felt presence of direct experience, which is a fancy term which just simply means we have to stop consuming our culture. We have to create culture. Don't watch TV. Don't read magazines. Don't even listen to NPR. Create your own road show. The nexus of space and time where you are now is the most immediate sector of your universe. And if you're worrying about Michael Jackson or Bill Clinton or somebody else, then you are disempowered. You're giving it all away to icons 
icons which are maintained by an electronic media so that you want to dress like X or have lips like Y or something. This is shit-brained, this kind of thinking. That is all cultural diversion. And what is real is you and your friends and your associations, your highs, your orgasms, your hopes, your plans, your fears. And we're told, no, we're unimportant, we're peripheral. Get a degree, get a job, get a this, get a that, and then you're a player. You don't even want to play in that game. You want to reclaim your mind and get it out of the hands of the cultural engineers who want to turn you into a half-baked moron consuming all this trash that's being manufactured out of the bones of a dying world. Where is that at?